Dr. Kevin Lobdell is the chairman and executive director of Perfect Care, a virtual care initiative to improve patient outcomes for cardiac surgery. Dr. Lobdell is board certified in thoracic surgery and has special qualifications in surgical critical care. His research interests include risk modeling and risk mitigation strategies, digital health and telemedicine, acute kidney injury, goal-directed therapy, metabolic response to injury and sepsis, early extubation, effects of BMI on CV outcomes, glycemic control, and aortic dissection. He has more than 75 publications and 150 presentations associated with these efforts. Dr. Lobdell is a Lieutenant Colonel and member of the U.S. Army Reserves, a Professor and System Director of Cardiac Surgery, Quality Education and Research at Atrium Health, and is the Chair of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Workforce on Research Development, where he serves on the Council on Quality Research and Patient Safety. He is also a member of the Research Committee for the Thoracic Surgery Foundation and is a Section Editor of CSATS for the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. Additionally, Dr. Lobdell holds memberships with the American Association for Thoracic Surgery, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgery, Southern Thoracic Surgical Association, and the ERAS Cardiac Surgery as Treasurer. He is an active board member, independent quality consultant for industry, an editor and reviewer, and serves in various other societal leadership positions. Uh, Dr. Kevin Lobdell, Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, what I learned from that introduction is I'm pretty old. <laughs> well, the main takeaway that I had is it's a very impressive resume. It is, it's packed with, you know, all of these society leadership positions, tons of research, and, and tons of focus and emphasis on patient quality and safety, which is, you know, phenomenal. Yeah, and yeah. Kevin, maybe to, to kick off there, um, you know, we first met a couple of years ago, I believe at a um, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Cardiac Society um, dinner meeting, I think one of the first uh, early on. So obviously you've been involved in cardiac quality for a while and, you know, now you're leading cardiac surgery quality at Atrium Health. Where did that passion for improving surgical quality come from? That's a good question, and I've thought about it a little bit. Let me start with some sort of basic attributes as I think about it, and I've focused on that a lot. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of or read the book called Attributes by Rich Devini, who um, is recently retired as a commander in SEAL Team 6, and he got um, together his thoughts along with some experts on basic attributes, categorized them, and then... Um, you know, provides that as a template for somebody to consider themselves or others. As I thought about that, um, along with other reading and thinking that I've done, I think fundamentally I'm somebody that finds it easy to find flow or autotelic personality. In other words, I find meaning in whatever it is, as opposed to, you know, there's something more to it. What that looked like, I think, as a kid growing up in Detroit, uh, you know, Midwest and all of the great and all of the challenging things like cold weather and piles of leaves and things like that is if I was shoveling snow, you know, I just put my mind to how do I do this as best as possible, sort of an efficient, effective sort of way. So perfect lines and, you know, fewest uh, shovel strokes, if you will. Right. Same thing, whether it was cutting lawns or raking leaves. Um, and so an extension of that, I think that I love to learn. Uh, I would say I'm competitive. And what does all that look like at this stage of life? I think it's really a passion for human performance. That's probably the thing that draws all of um, what I'm interested in. And think about it like the gap between where things are and what they could be with, you know, a little bit of thought and effort. And, and that's probably what continues to drive me professionally. Very cool. I, I, oh, sorry, Alan, go ahead. Well, so I, I was actually wondering, so, you know, the last, at least the last few years, you've been leading a virtual care initiative called Perfect Care. And that seems to fit kind of in line with what you were just saying around, you know, finding that optimal performance and, and striving, you know, for better. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what Perfect Care is and, and maybe why you started it? Sure. Um, probably the best way to start would be just 
an anecdote. I remember being at a patient's bedside, and this is not the beginning of the thought, but it's emblematic of the effort and the value, specifically as it would relate to like the patient clinician interaction. We walked up to one of the patients in the intensive care unit, and one of the family members said, Oh, great. Um, I have some questions. We haven't seen a doctor for a couple of days. And I remember just thinking, you know, this was a time where, say, my daughters were middle school and just starting to be equipped with iPhones and they would FaceTime me, right? And I thought, why aren't we doing this for our patients and their family? This is just readily available technology for synchronous communication. As you would know, too, there's sort of the dysynchronous efforts that need to go on, but I remember that being a point on the curve of both observations and opportunities to say, we can do better. More strategically, what drove me, one end of the spectrum would be data as a platform. How do you aggregate uh, large volumes of data from disparate sources and then make them available for anybody to tap into and make sense of so that they can learn and improve? And then the other end of that spectrum for perfect care is um, the remote patient monitoring. So that clinician and uh, patient interaction. And so with those things in mind, people have collaborated, used data to learn, but it's typically or at best been clinical like STS type data along with financials. Um, and then again, at that other end of the spectrum, there has been poor penetrance of use of remote patient monitoring. So as I contemplated those things, I thought, we don't want to just do what other people are doing. What are the next obvious steps? And it's to get information from other phases of care through the medical internet of things. So think of the biosensors that are readily available, like scales and blood pressure cuffs and O2SAT monitors, as well as just activity trackers. And with that, we can get information that we've never had before to start to learn and improve and fill in the gaps in our care. Another great anecdote on that curve that I described was taking care of a, a close friend, John Fox, and it's okay to talk about because it's public information, but when he was a coach of the Denver Broncos, was in town, um, had some problems on the golf course. I had just finished playing. I got a call on the house phone at the club that we both belong to, and I was sort of scared thinking something horrible happened. I don't know about you, but when was the last some time somebody called you to a, you know, landline? Um, I thought it was something, you know, family oriented. What well, was John? I ran over there. We got him taken care of. He had heart surgery a couple of days later, went home, did beautifully. But what I realized with John and Rob and his wife were the gaps. I would go each day and, you know, spend time with them, walk as he was rehabilitating, listen to what their challenges were. They would contact me. And it was just shocking to me how we in healthcare thought we were doing a great job, right? You had a good operation, see in a couple of weeks, but because of this close relationship, I was actually intimately involved and realized like, you know, John's lightheaded, what's his blood pressure? I don't know, we don't have a blood pressure cuff, you know, these sorts of things. And so you say sophisticated people with resources, lots of people there to help them, like, you know, the Denver Broncos medical team and all, but still these gaps. So that again was a driver or a point on the curve of these observations to drive us to want to do better. You know, Kevin, I love that story because maybe it seems obvious to you to, to have cared about what happened to John after discharge, but um, I think that shows a lot of empathy. And let's be honest, there are, there are a lot of surgeons in the same situation who maybe didn't have that thought that you did. So I think that's the volumes about your, your character and, and your, your qualities as a physician. Um, I think one of the neat things about your initiative is that, you know, remote monitoring during, you know, COVID. Uh, has become more of an obvious thing to do, but you were doing this before COVID even started. And I was curious, you know, back then, um, I can only imagine that um, depending on what the financial incentives were in the system where you are, you know, that could be a barrier to get people actually wanting to do remote monitoring and delivering, you know, an extra level of care if it wasn't expected or wasn't paid for. Um, did you run into any barrier with that? Did Were there any 
you know, bundled payments or aligned incentives that made it easier for folks to, to buy into this when you first started? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, simplistically, if you look at the genesis of the idea and then the execution on the plan, it was 10 years plus. Like when I go back and, you know, search documents to find the label perfect care, you know, it dated back somewhere around 2008, 9, 10, something like that. So had been ruminating on that. And then the idea of not just delivering perfect care, but perfecting care. Jeff Rose, uh, colleague and president of Sanger Heart and Vascular Institute, now the leader of our service line for Atrium, said, yeah, Kevin, we're not just, you know, interested in delivering perfect care. We're here to perfect care. And again, it's that sort of interaction with people over time that continue to fuel the fire and drive us to doing this. But like anything, um, there's probably the double-edged sword of personality traits that allow one to lead that create problems but solve problems at the same time. So I would critique myself and say I'm not usually uh, encumbered much by norms or um, sensing a lot of the environment, but more what are fundamental values and then sort of relentlessly pursuing those things. I think that if I was better at sensing things and um, probably an evolving patience might have gotten a little further faster, but it is what it is. Oh, and then specifically too, uh, part of the strategic plan you had asked, um, for instance, bundled care, we wanted to design something that made sense longer term. And so it includes, again, novel data, um, longer follow-up, um, being able to leverage rare talent with technology, a system, as I mentioned, with data as a platform that can learn. So these are all part of the strategic imperatives. But piecing that together, and, and you'll get as a, a uh, entrepreneur, like selling that vision as a solution to people's problems is not always easy, but fortunately, um, and you alluded to it a little bit, it, and so did I when we uh, chatted after the intro, I'm quite frankly surprised sometimes when I look back and think, you know, how did this happen? Like, how did things converge, say, over the last five and 10 years? I think it's the relentless desire to learn and improve that finally get validated and you have enough sort of credibility. And with that, this convergence of attributes and accomplishments, credibility led to the Duke Endowment, uh, you know, fortunately believing in what we were talking about, maybe specifically me too, and funding this. And as you might imagine, you can have a great idea, but you're not always going to get it funded. So that really became um, the catalyst to us going from idea to executing on the plan. Well, I, I love the fact that you mentioned a bit earlier how um, the, the term perfect care, you know, you, you've been thinking about it since I think you said 2008. And so it just reminds me of that concept of a, of a 10 year overnight success, right? It's not, this is not something you've just woke up one day yesterday and, and started working on you. You've been working on this for a long time and that's what, you know, made it so successful. So congrats on, on, on continuing to persevere um, in being such a pioneer in this. I think one thing Alan, I wanted to touch on was around how important this initiative has been given the diverse, you know, demographic in your population, you know, many patients, I'm, I'm assuming live in rural and more remote areas. Um, how has perfect care and remote monitoring um, improved access to care for your patients? Um, um, love to get a sense of, of stories you're hearing or, or what you're seeing in the data. Yeah, it's a terrific question. So to frame that, it was probably a couple of years ago, the Wall Street Journal talked about rural America and some of the challenges. Um, and interestingly, North Carolina is the second most rural state in the United States. And when I say that, as you might imagine, there's, you know, the definition of what does it mean to be rural? So it's not think wilderness of Montana, but it's how many people populate a state, but are a certain distance from a metropolitan area. And so the two most rural states 
in the United States are Texas and North Carolina, not as you might think again from a wilderness standpoint of Alaska or Montana. Clearly there's a lot of open space there, but there are few people. So that became a real opportunity and something again that the Duke Endowment was interested in. But even more fundamentally, one of the things that I challenged myself when I was thinking about perfect care, you know, and talking with colleagues about it is just one of those basic, you know, 10 year journeys, as you alluded to. And that is how about if instead of people coming to us for care, we figure out how to take care to people, specifically in our case, associated with cardiac surgery. And what that means is clearly they're going to come to centers to have this highly technical procedure, but we should challenge ourselves to take the perioperative care to them. Um, and, and that was, again, sort of a strategic imperative or fundamental driver of doing what we've done. Does that answer your question? It, it does, Kevin. I hope you're not hearing my, my what's going on outside my, my building here. Oh, that's not good. at all. Um, I, I, I loved what you, that phrase you use around bringing care to the patient. It kind of reminds me how I think more and more health systems, I think atrium included, you know, as, as you kind of grow your services, you're, you're thinking about how do we serve patients, you know, not just in North Carolina, South Carolina, you know, I think Georgia now too, there's partnership, but I mean, you could serve patients across the country um, with leveraging technology like you're doing now. Absolutely. And in, in specific to perfect care and like improvement networks, collaboration, you know, the work that you're doing at Seamless MD that fosters it. It's not just the operation, right? But it's collecting the data and empowering us to share. And so an example like that is we've now signed an agreement to collaborate with the Virginia Collaborative. That's 17 mm -hmm. programs. We're sort of early discussions with some of the leaders that you're familiar with in enhanced recovery in Maryland, and they've got another 11 programs. And so what happens sort of in a team of teams type of way is you have data and um, leaders that are interested in learning and improving. And in a digital world, you can connect, right, share, learn together. And you can even prioritize things in a way where somebody works on one effort, another person or a group works on another effort, and then you just trade notes, if you will. Yeah. So Kevin, I was wondering, you know, internally to make any digital patient engagement effort successful, the team needs to be bought in. And it sounds like, you know, you already have a, a strong fit for, you know, certain individuals will work on one part and you'll be working on another and you'll share notes. But I'm curious, was there um, a particular way in which you've corralled your cardiac team to stand behind perfect care? And, and was there potentially any pushback that you received from your team? And if so, how did you navigate that? You know, I would answer that by in part describing a leadership journey, right? When we moved to Charlotte in 2004, it was after an auto accident in the end of my, you know, operative career, uh, going back and doing a critical care fellowship and then coming here to lead both the adult and the pediatric cardiac critical care efforts. And a realization that I had early on was, I always thought I was probably pretty good at doing things, but I wasn't very good at doing things through other people. And that really in, in a word is leadership. I ended up going back to business school at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business, getting a certificate in healthcare management. Think of it like a mini MBA. And the beauty of that is every uh, module was the opportunity to dig deep into an area and learn and try to improve. What it sort of looked like was I realized there was an expert on everything that I thought was very subjective, but was actually fairly quantified. And oftentimes that was a Harvard Business School professor, right? So I would just dig into that. Leadership became one of those um, opportunities to dig deeply. And so I think again, driver of not being so skilled at um, working through others, um, learning about leadership, being a voracious student of learning and in, in this opportunity. I made a lot of mistakes along the way. Like I thought of it, here's what we need to do. And guess what happens? 
change doesn't take place. But then you read something like John Cotter's work and he'll prescribe, this is what you need to do to lead change. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, other books like Quinn describing leadership is difficult um, and you may not get to finish the journey. That's what it's like to be disruptive or even a very human example, um, Wayne Sotil person that I've worked with now for 15 plus years came and one day as he was going to meet with me, gave me Marshall Gold's, Goldsmith's book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And it shows a ladder with some rung missings. Well, you don't have to read the book, right? I mean, if somebody tells you that, you get the point, like I'm missing some tools in the toolbox. Um, what that looked like by the time, you know, eight, 10 years pass and we get a perfect care grant is enough understanding of leadership and change that what my model looks like is we need to solve their problems as opposed to, you know, you have a view of the world and you're going to impose that on somebody. But along with that, you have to have scaffolding. You have to have thought through this pretty carefully, but through appreciative inquiry, you figure out and sort of catalog not only their challenges, but prioritize them through this appreciative inquiry, have them build out the new model. And then it's our model and they're bought in by definition, if that makes sense. Yep. Yeah, it does. And, and Kevin, I was wondering, um, you know, you're leading a pretty comprehensive, you know, virtual care initiative with Perfect Care. And, you know, when you think about um, giving advice or, or sharing lessons with providers who are maybe in, uh, embarking on doing something similar for the first time, um, any lessons or insights you can share in terms of, gosh, if, if I could just go back in time and tell myself to, to, to do this instead or not make that mistake, um, what advice would you give to a you know, someone like yourself who's leading a cardiac or even a non-cardiac initiative, but is looking to implement this sort of comprehensive virtual care program, what, what would you tell them? What pitfalls could they avoid or um, and so forth? I, I think one would be, um, again, a leadership lesson as opposed to declaring it would really be using the interrogative. In other words, ask a lot of questions and people will tell you what you need to know. Um, the other that I've probably discounted all along um, in life is um, the people component and finding the right people to be on the team and do the work is probably far more important than any vision because you know very well from your journey where you started and where you thought you were going to go um, is different in its timeline, its course and everything else. But when you have a great team, you will learn faster and go further than, you know, your competitors. One of the great examples of that, uh, I remember around the, you know, the economic challenges of 2008 was somebody asked Goldman Sachs, how was it that they thrived during that time and came out stronger? And somebody responded, I don't remember who it was, like, well, we didn't know any more than anybody else. We just focused on making sure that we had the best team and teamwork and figured out that, you know, or figured that we would come out better than others if we focused on those things. I think that's a, a great uh, point, uh, you know, Kevin, I think one of the, the phrases I've really come to love is, you know, that the team you build is the, the organization you build or the company that you build, because you're right, at the end of the day, if you, you know, have the right team, the team will come up with the right strategy or the right execution plan and all these other things. So that makes a, a lot of sense to me. Um, I, I think one of the interesting things, I guess, about, about healthcare is that um, you often don't have control, I think, in many ways of, of who is on the team. Right. I mean, it's different where, you know, Al and I are, are in a company and in many ways, you know, we can control like the hiring process, but like yourself, Kevin, like a lot of times everyone in the healthcare team is kind of thrown together. If you're in a more teaching 
environment. Your residents are coming in and out every couple of weeks. So it seems like quite a complex environment. So, so I'm always impressed when I hear about um, clinical teams who are able to kind of sustain you know, quality initiatives despite personnel coming in, coming out. It, it takes the right culture and the right um, processes in place to keep that that sort of initiative going. So, so that um, I, I, can't, I can't even imagine how complex it is in, a, in, a, in the, the health system environment when, when teams keep changing. But kudos to you and Group at for continuing to, to do that so successfully. Um, I think one thing, Alan, I we're, we're hoping to touch on as well was, um, you know, your resume is really impressive. Um, I mean, Al, Alan noted how like you're you're so involved in quality initiatives, society initiatives, the reserves now, um, you know, clinical work still. I mean, gosh, that's, that's a lot. Um, were, were you always juggling this many things like throughout your life? Uh, is, that, is that a more recent thing? And how do you do it? I've thought about that a little bit and thank you for the kind words. Um, one of the things that's resonated on me as I've again framed a lot of this in sort of optimal human performance, not my words, Rich Devini talks about that. I'm sure others have talked about it, but there's a phenomenon uh, with a lot of the driven gritty high performers that they find in special operations. And it relates to them being maybe average or above average people. The people that were the smartest and the fastest and all of those other things, when uh, asked to endure in difficult times, uh, oftentimes it was the first time that they felt that think about like the runner, the person that's just the most gifted runner from junior high, high school, that sort of thing. Somebody makes them cold. They think I don't like that. Or they make them wrestle. They think that smells and it's hard and it hurts. I don't want to do that. But the average guy had to like push through all of those things. And so somewhere in there, there's sort of this average above average, but just, you know, determination grit that, you know, I'm going to do this. And what it looks like as you look back is maybe a thick CV, but put another way, it didn't always look that way. Um, another thing that struck me the other day, and it gets to this concept of flow and autotelic personality, was just the joy in doing hard things. And it sounds a little counterintuitive, but one thing I've realized as I reflect on life is it's a whole lot more about the journey than it is sort of the goals or the end state. And when you do hard things, that gives life in itself meaning. And then the beauty in work, for instance, that you do um, is that's a distinct competitive advantage, right? Because other people think, oh, that's hard. I don't want to do that. But if you just find that, you know, to give life meaning and fuels your company's success, it makes it pretty easy. So you have to do a little reframing, but that's how I would sum that up. Does that make sense? It does. And your camera reminds me. So, you know, when we, when we do hiring um, at Seamless, one of the things we look for to your point is resilience and grit. And it's funny because part of the interview process, you know, we ask a lot about challenges and obstacles. And sometimes I feel as if um, people are, maybe embarrassed to, to, for us to know, Hey, we, I had a challenge overcoming something. I wasn't the best at something. I wasn't a natural at something. And they're trying to maybe hide that because they see it as a weakness, but, but I actually love that. I, I love it when I hear someone has overcome, you know, obstacles that, that I didn't have or someone else didn't have because it shows grit, it shows resilience because as you, as you and, and, and I and Alan, but um, all know healthcare is hard change management, innovation, healthcare is really hard. And so, um, you know, we need people who have grit and resilience in order to, to last in our organization, because I can tell you, and you can tell us in healthcare, you're going to come through obstacle after obstacle. And, and we want people who've had to you know, be super resilient. So, so it, your comments definitely resonated with me for sure. Yeah. You know, related to that, you'll like this story. We, part of our journey has been talking about the United States and Canada and hockey and some of those things. And again, recently I was reflecting on that and I thought, man, I've been in a lot of fights in my life. Um, I got kicked out of hockey when I was playing intramural hockey at the University of Michigan for fighting. I got kicked out of basketball uh, in medical school for fighting. But the, the most recent sort of realization was 
wow, I lost most of those fights. <laughs> you know, like point being, I wasn't good at it. It was just somebody who was competitive and driven um, but, and didn't give up. But anyway, I thought you'd enjoy that. That's awesome. Um, you so, learn from your losses, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Kevin, I, I'm wondering, you know, as the industry shifts more towards value-based care, there's an increased emphasis on, you know, providing exceptional quality at a reduction or a reduced cost. How do these trends or how have they affected your um, uh, cardiac surgery program and how does perfect care kind of fit into this new reimbursement model? It's a great question. In fact, um, just this morning, an email came out, you know, amongst our team about looking at yet another angle, but let me give you some of the highlights as we're, you know, very close to two years. We have a little over 400 patients uh, enrolled in the program so far. So here are sort of highlights. Uh, if we're looking at adult cardiac surgery, coronaries, valves, and coronary plus valves, it appears that our readmission rates are a little better than 50% uh, better or less than benchmark. So when you aggregate all of our patients, it's somewhere in the area of four and a half to maybe 4.8%, depending on exactly, you know, when we count the last patient, it's a very dynamic process. And as you probably know from the cited thoracic surgeons, the coronary benchmark is 10.1. I think aortic valves and some of the others are 12 plus. So that's excellent. Our length of stay, both post-operative and total, appear to be in the area 20 or 25% better. So if you ask, what does that mean? It means we have the confidence to let people go home instead of waiting another day, right, because of family circumstances or whatever, um, and also confidence that they don't come back. We're starting to look at some of the things like the skilled nursing inpatient facility, and it appears that that's decreased as we've employed perfect care. And as you might imagine, we've got to look carefully at that because there's also the possibility, for instance, and I'm just being the devil's advocate that we didn't want to do that as much in a COVID environment, right? Which is sort of an epi phenomenon. We are carefully looking at dollars and these are preliminary um, look using benchmark data for what is a hospital day cost, what are readmissions uh, cost. It looks like at this point um, that somewhere between $3,700 and $4,400 per patient, risk-adjusted matched patients if they've had perfect care versus non-perfect care, meaning our own physicians and clinicians are own institutions. And the only thing that differs is they were enrolled in perfect care versus not. So think about that in today's world. If you say, what are the costs of surgery? We're probably in the area of 10% better. So again, fundamentally, when you would look at that, you'd say, really, you can deliver better care, meaning fewer readmissions, shorter length of stay, um, for 10% less, that's enormous, right? I mean, think of margins in hospitals tend to be two to 4% when you take all of the cases and mix it together. If somebody said, I can give you 10%, you'd say, sign me up. Okay. Um, we're also looking at some of the other uh, data like reduced number of office visits and think about that from a business standpoint, you can use your brick and mortar facilities for more new patients, right? We have fewer ED visits. And then if you think of second and third order effects, if you can let people go home, come back less often, not as a, you know, valuable to society because they're not wasting time and incurring risk of traveling and all, but also the healthcare facilities then have open operating rooms and beds to do more good things for the public. So that's how we're looking at it at this point. Again, some early data. I'm giving you broad brush strokes, but it looks very favorable. Kevin, what about um, patient, just anecdotally speaking, how have they perceived perfect care? Are they feeling more connected to your care team? Like what, what sort of um, testimonials are our patients giving you? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Some of the best things we've heard, which I'm sure you've heard too on your journey, like we liked having an extra set of eyes. I like being able to reach out and have somebody connect with me, you know, through uh, the equivalent of text messaging. But I will also relate to you uh, a story that it's easy to be enamored with world-class results, which I think we've all you know, seen whether it's through other people or with our own experience. But we got some feedback yesterday from somebody, you know, in our health core organization that we took care of and interacted and we found out some of their messages didn't get answered. And when they ultimately did go to clinic, people were asking them, you know, for instance, what was your blood pressure this morning? And the obvious question was, didn't you look? Because, you know, I took it and it was uploaded via Bluetooth to the platform, et cetera, et cetera. So there's opportunities always when we're reflecting on what we do to both um, be proud of the work we do, reinforce those good things with the team, but also learn and improve what we do. Well, okay, well, let me first say congratulations on both the qualitative feedback uh, you've received from patients and, and, but also I think the quantitative, uh, metrics that you share are just phenomenal. So congratulations on that. That, that that's amazing. I, I also wanted to ask you, um, you know, we, it, COVID is still going on and certainly, uh, the pandemic has accelerated the demand for going digital and access, um, and all that. Um, and I think, you know, when we looked at the data, you know, video visits, you know, you know, increased dramatically at the start of the pandemic. And then I think a lot of folks saw, that start to level off, and and so I'm curious your thoughts on you know once we you know get back to the um, get past the pandemic and you know more patient communication is, is happening you know in person uh, compared to what's going on in the pandemic. Um, what do you think will stay virtual, and what are the parts of the patient communication piece that you think will you know inevitably go back to to more in person and face to face? It's a good question, and I think um, we touched on these concepts, but the more pragmatic part of me, you know, being on the other side of the success, seeing what happened will be the demands will drive the virtualization. And when I say that, they're now more understanding of virtual care or digital health. So we're aware we see risks, we see benefits. And so what will happen through policy and payment is, you know, an evolution of how we look at those things. And people, for instance, would look at the tools that you've pioneered through Seamless MD or enhanced recovery efforts have promoted, or, you know, a pilot program like Perfect Care. And those then get scaled or utilized in a way that the bar changes or they set new demands. And so simplistically, what that can look like as we go from in the United States, much of a fee for service model, say for coronaries, and then start comparing results, you know, with public reporting, and then thinking we want longer term data and some novel data will evolve to where bundles will be more common. And then it's in the various teams and organizations best interest to be able to figure out how to do better with less and they'll use these sorts of things what that looks like in atrium you know very specifically during the covid environment as you alluded we had a real head start in doing the work and as opposed to like me or the perfect care team running out and say hey look we have these tools you know um, you should do this it would be more answering phone calls and participating in meetings and so forth, sharing the vision, and then people basically latching on to solutions for their unique problems and using them. And again, I think in that very pragmatic way of leadership and how we're going to evolve in healthcare, it'll look like the latter as opposed to a very well-planned strategic effort. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I actually, uh, Kevin, I, that... I resonate a lot with that. I mean, you know, whenever, at least locally here, I'm, I'm involved in, you know, government or, or payment roundtables, and people often ask me, well, Josh, like, what can we do to drive, you know, faster adoption of digital health and related technology or innovation? And my answer is always, well, um, you know, you got to change, if you want to get more adoption, um, you know, change the incentive models to drive adoption. And the way I look at it is, you know, the incentive models shouldn't be based on, you know, 
you know, adopting more seamless or things like seamless specifically, it should be about, okay, have the right payment models in place. And if you do, um, the right innovation will be pulled out of the system, whether it's technology, whether it's things like ERAS or other models of care, just get the incentives right. And then the right innovations will get pulled by the system. Um, and I, I don't care if that's seamless. I, you know, I want what's best for the patient at the end of the day. And, and if, if seamless has to evolve to, you know, fit in a new environment, then, then we'll evolve. And the way that, you know, your team at Atrium evolves as well. Yeah, absolutely. And then once you have some of those policy and payment decisions in place too, again, you share with clinicians and they'll tell you things that you'd never thought of. And I remember when we were just sort of telling the story, sharing with one of the colleagues is we would think about scaling things, right? Somebody said, oh, this would be terrific for my clinical research because those people end up you know, fairly high demand in the numbers for office visits and so forth. And then in this case, orthopedic surgery, they couldn't use their office to bring in new patients for more procedures. And you think, well, again, I hadn't thought about that, but you give them a tool, that's a great place for them to start. That solves a problem they have. They'll scale it subsequently, maybe for their routine hip arthroplasty, knee arthroplasty, but they started in a different place. Okay. A last question that I have, Kevin, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask it, but we actually, Josh and I reviewed one of your latest manuscripts, the technological advancements uh, to enhance cardiac or enhance recovery after cardiac surgery. Um, I'm curious what inspired you to write that paper in the first place. And then part two of that question is, is could you briefly explain, you know, which technological advancements you feel is maybe underappreciated today? Sure. Um, so again, sort of reflecting on, say, the last five years, six years, something like that. What I have found I'm doing is devote a year to a topic where there's a big gap between the way it is and the way it should be. And some of that, for instance, might be how do we assess and mitigate modifiable risks? Another one would have been how do we make decisions and then execute on um, the, the plan? And the more recent one, you know, related to perfect care and the things that we're talking about here is digital health. And I probably perseverated more than a year on that, but study these topics deeply, uh, combination of operationalizing lessons learned, uh, presenting, publishing. And that was a manifestation, quite frankly, of some work that we were doing through the patient safety workforce um, with the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. We wrote about digital health. There was this opportunity to dive even more deeply into it, and that was the genesis of it. And I think it's imperative whenever we learn things to share it with other people. Maybe one of my gifts is make it simple enough for somebody as simple as me to understand it as opposed to you know, the true experts in the area. Well, I, I mean, it was definitely well written. Um, I could understand it. So, to, to your point, that was fantastic. Um, You're kind. <laughs> so, I think at this point, I'm just looking at the time. Um, we're going to dive into what we call the fast five questions, and sure. so these are basically five questions that that will kind of rapid fire uh, at you, and you can answer as succinctly as you'd like. So, the first question that we have is, what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? Boy, that's a, a terrific question. Um, and it's pretty hard to give you a single book, but let me give you some ideas and then I'll get to a single book. Team of Teams by Stan McChrystal made quite an impact on me, the concept of the network world and how do you work uh, within it to execute uh, at a high tempo and in a very effective sort of way. Another book that resonated with me is a history of a guy named Adam Brown, who was a SEAL Team 6 operator called Fearless. And it's a, an incredible story of somebody that's had mighty challenges and overcome them while fighting for something that he believed in deeply. Another one that had similar impact by a guy named Doug Stanton, who's a writer who lives in Traverse City, Michigan, called Horse Soldiers. Um, maybe you've seen the movie called 12 strong, and it was about the uh, special operators, Green Berets that were dropped into Afghanistan uh, in October, I believe it was, of uh, 
2001, right after 9-11, to begin to function as force multipliers to change the uh, momentum in the war on terror. Uh, but if you got to one, and I really tried hard to think about this and didn't want to answer with some of the standard things like the Bible or, you know, Winston Churchill, I think it would be Clayton Christensen's book, How Will You Measure Your Life? And if you haven't read it, it's worth reading. If you want simple version of it, there's various things on YouTube uh, or even uh, in Harvard Business Review where he um, has brief versions of it. But what he did was realize as he looked back um, on his life and colleagues from Harvard Business School that a lot of them accomplished a lot of great things, but if they looked at it, they say, I wouldn't have done it that way. And he uses business principles and language to help people in a similar situation um, look at their life, measure it, and be much more deliberate, prioritized, disciplined about how they live their life to accomplish what they'd like to. Awesome. No, I'm definitely going to check those out. Question two, how has an apparent failure set you up for greater success? I think in my case, it would be lots of failures, but probably never seeing it that way. Mm -hmm. And also the pain that one encounters with these serial failures really is the fuel for the journey. So in other words, you really have to realize like failure is just a part of the journey and it's an opportunity to learn and improve. And instead of um, that old, uh, you know, painful process, what you do is you go with the flow or the old concept, if you can't get out of it, get into it. In other words, okay, that happened. Now, what do I do? And you reframe that. And what happens is you end up living a far um, simpler, uh, lower friction life. And uh, it just seems to get better and better. Yeah, definitely. Question three, that's a little bit different. Would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? I think the answer to that uh, is super speed. And the reason I say that is time is finite. Like you can always get more people to lift for you or come up with some better machine. Um, reading others' minds, you may find out some things you don't want to know. Um, but I'll tell you a great anecdote. I was talking to our daughters and often I'll share things that I think I've discovered or learned and say, you know, we're fortunate, we're safe, we're healthy, we're loved, we live in a great country, we have opportunity, we're educated, those sorts of things. But, you know, the thing that would change our life would be to be able to get from A to B faster. Mm -hmm. And here's the funny part about that. I was telling her how the only thing like that, that's tangible, reasonable, that would change our life would be really having a plane to be able to get from A to B faster, as opposed to driving or whatever. Well, one night back to iPhones and sitting around the table at night, um, our youngest daughter was being the spirited person she was, and it resulted in, okay, you're done with dinner and give us your phone. Subsequently, my wife and older daughter went somewhere. And the first thing Audrey, our younger daughter said was, dad, I'm hungry. And I had to, you know, we just went through this, you're, you're done. And then it was, I want my phone back. We went through that. And she said, you give me my phone back or I'm telling mom, you're saving money for an airplane. <laughs> and so that's how it ties together with time you know i think that truly if we could do things faster it uh takes advantage of this knowledge that time's probably our most precious uh resource mm -hmm. one thing you can't buy that's right mm -hmm. that's excellent so uh, question four what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane so as a learner is the way i would look at this i'm constantly looking for deviations and I would say fundamentally the things that outsiders would be shocked by is how great the positive deviations are and how 
negative the negative deviations are. And when I say that, there are some incredible uh, leaders. There are some incredibly selfless people that like respond to COVID-19 with all of this uncertainty and get up and do it day after day after day. And while people hear that, I don't know that they really understand how amazing so many people are in medicine, whether it's doctors, nurses, administrators, physical therapists, respiratory therapists, entrepreneurs such as yourself that you know want us to do better. But at the same time, here would be a great anecdote about the negative deviations. There was a study commissioned um, by a series of economists back around 2010 by IBM, and they quantitated the world's waste on healthcare at that point, somewhere in the area of $4.3 trillion per year. And it's just mind boggling, like we'll say complex, but when you frame it in wasteful, I think most people would be shocked to know that. Yeah, absolutely. And so the last question that we have, this is a COVID-19 related question. Uh, what is one hobby or activity you've gotten into since the beginning of the pandemic? I don't know if we would categorize it as a hobby, but the most noteworthy change for me during that period of time was um, getting commissioned in the United States Army and then going through the early processes of in what they call in processing and then most recently um, direct commissioning at Fort Sill, uh, Oklahoma for about three and a half weeks. Uh, it's, it's been studying the customs and courtesies, understanding fundamentals like dress and drill and ceremony, as well as, uh, you know, a real focus on fitness. The, Army has recently changed its standards. There used to be fitness tests that were uh, gender and age adjusted, but new Army combat fitness test doesn't care how old you are or anything else. You just have to pass it. So I've really doubled down on my fitness efforts and, you know, tying that together with perfect care. I've recently evolved from using Fitbit to whoop and um, really, I think, learned a lot about strain, recovery, sleep, and how to optimize my own personal performance. So um, that journey has been great of learning, improving, being more resilient, being more fit uh, through the connection with the military. That's, that's amazing. And, and Kevin, I was curious, were you planning to, to, to get commissioned um, even before um, the pandemic happened, or did you decide that during the middle of the pandemic? Um, when did that decision happen? So again, good question. Um, my father, who will turn 95 in a couple of weeks, was a uh, Battle of the Bulge, World War II veteran, quite a way to become an adult, right? Um, and was a paratrooper in the Korean War, and I had other uh, family members, uncles, both killed in action in World War II, as well as um, frontline infantry type work uh, through the Marine Corps and others. Um, so it was always a part of our family. And I always thought that I would do it. And an example, of, as I described, point on the curve, when I gave my chief's talk at the University of Minnesota, I gave it on war surgery. And as you probably know, surgery and war synonymous right in certain ways and it was something that i always found profound and fascinating um and thought i would be a part of but life gets busy and you know a year becomes 10 and a decade becomes two and i really realized it, it could have been when you and i first met i think it was in san diego might have been the aats and i thought i need to do this. And I met with the recruiters and started the ball rolling. It's somewhat slow. I mean, you have to go through mountains of paperwork and security clearance and all that sort of thing, but um, it was executing on the plan. And quite frankly, like many of the other examples we talked about, things sort of converge or coalesce when it's doable. The family's old enough, independent enough. I have enough freedom to maneuver professionally 
that I could do something like this. And August 13th, 2020, Stan McChrystal, um, you know, the author of Team of Teams was kind enough to commission me uh, into the US Army. And it's just been an incredible journey. It's, it's really powerful. That's amazing. And, and Kevin, I think what I really like about this podcast is that I think no matter, you know, what um, someone's interest is, um, we just covered so many wide ranging topics. I think there's a nugget for everyone, whether they're in healthcare or not. I think there's a nugget for everyone. So that, that's been a really great thing to have on, on the episode today. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, you know, again, relating it to efforts and age, that sort of thing. I remember Jim Fan, who was the chair of the workforce on patient safety for the Society of Thoracic Surgeons at one point a couple of years ago said, well, Kevin, you know, you, you need to be mentoring people. And I remember thinking like, I'm not that old, like, what are you talking about? But when you embrace that, right, and you can share, it becomes a real gift. So whether it's at home, you know, for your, your children or whether it's at work um, or for our patients, uh, it's an opportunity to say, Here, here's the buffet, take whatever you want from it. Well, there's a, there's a lot of stuff at, at this buffet today. So, so we're <laughs> grateful for that. Thank you, Kevin. You're kind. It's been great to share. And I can't thank you enough, one, for this opportunity to share, but two, for all the work that you're doing with Seamless MD, your support of enhanced recovery, and just digital transformation of healthcare in general. It's really one of the rare opportunities, quite frankly, to be incredibly motivated because of the opportunity. But also if somebody said, hey, you can do a lot more with less, how often do those things come up? I mean, that's like a once in a, in a millennium sort of uh, opportunity. So again, thank you both for leading those efforts and persevering even when it's tough. Thank like you, said, we're learning a lot from you and how to do that. So, so I appreciate the kind words. That means a lot to us. You guys are great. I've really appreciated the journey. And again, I should have highlighted that if, if you ask, how did that happen? It, it's really when you make connections with people that it fuels that fire. And Josh, when you and I first met, you know, you, you trust somebody, you see that desire, right, to go in a similar direction, and you just have a lot of fun along the way. So you've done that for all of us that are involved in these enhanced recovery efforts and can't thank you enough. Thank you so much, Kevin. That, that means a lot.